I'm pretty sure the beautiful tale of Snow White has been heard all over the world at this point. The story was Disney's first animated feature film, and it was released in 1937. The tale became an instant classic. It's been about 86 years since the classic movie shared the story of Snow White with the masses, and I'm sure a lot of you can easily narrate the story of Snow White by heart. However, the real story of Snow White is disturbingly different from the one you've all come to know. You see, the original tale of Snow White that inspired the classic movie was based on centuries of real folklore that was cataloged by two famous folklorists called the Brothers Grimm. The original tale was cataloged in Grimm's Fairy Tales in the year 1812, and the details of the ghastly tale were much darker and so much more twisted than what we've all come to know. Disney couldn't release the original tale as it was, so some changes were made to give us the Happy Ever After version that we all know today. But if you'd like to know the truth, I'd advise you to keep listening, because this is the true story of the princess with skin as white as snow. There was nothing I loved more than watching the beautiful snowflakes fall from the sky from my bedroom window. It was something I did every winter. My mother once told me she came up with my name on a day like this. She said she was sewing at her window, which had a frame, made of fine black ebony wood, just like I love to do. She looked up at the snow while sewing, and she accidentally pricked her finger with the needle. As the drops of blood fell from her finger and onto the snow, my mother thought the red on the white looked so beautiful. It was then that my mother said to herself, If only I had a child as white as snow, as red as blood, and as black as the wood in this frame. Little did she know that she would get her wish soon, as a little while after that, I was born. My mother told me that I was everything she wished for. As my skin was as white as snow, my lips were as red as blood, and my hair was as black as ebony wood. So she called me her little Snow White. The early days of my childhood were the best days of my life. The palace was truly a happy place back then. I loved my father, but my mother and I were inseparable. We would do everything together, and she'd often tell me stories. But as I grew older, and with the mysterious and untimely demise of my father, I started to grow apart from my mother. It wasn't my choice to do so. I still loved my mother very much, but I soon noticed that her eyes, which once looked at me with love and joy, now looked at me with hate and envy. It felt like my very existence both disturbed and disgusted my mother every year that I grew older. I'd done nothing wrong for my own mother to treat me like this, and I was given no explanation as to why she looked at me with such hate and jealousy. I'd recently turned seven, and my mother didn't even talk to me on my birthday. To be honest, it seemed like she hated me even more for adding another year. In addition to her strange behavior towards me, there's been a lot of rumors going around the palace, as everyone calls my mother a witch. I didn't believe them at first, but one night, while passing her room, I'd seen her slit the throat of a little black cat and pour its blood on her naked body. A little while after that, I'd seen her carving figurines from what looked like human bones. These weren't the only strange things I'd witnessed as I also heard her on numerous occasions talking with a strange-looking mirror in her room. I'd never gotten close to the mirror, but every time I looked at it, it felt like the mirror was alive. I could feel this menacing aura around it, and it always gave me chills up my spine. There's also a very disturbing rumor that I don't want to believe, as a lot of people say that it was my mother who killed my father with witchcraft. A makeshift doll with pins sticking out of it was uncovered in the palace, and my father's corpse was found disfigured in a similar manner as the doll. His eyes were nowhere to be found. They told the people that it was a horrible disease that killed him, but many people believed my mother, the queen, committed the heinous act to gain control of the kingdom. They also believed this is why she hasn't remarried as my mother was a very beautiful woman, so she wouldn't have a problem finding a suitor. 
Even with all these rumors and everything I had seen, I still had hope that my mother possessed a little bit of love for me somewhere in her heart. But I soon realized how wrong I was. As that very night, my mother ordered me to be murdered at the hands of a huntsman. I was awoken roughly in the dead of night, and I was pulled out of bed by a man I didn't know. I was then violently dragged out of the castle and into the woods. The man's firm grip hurt my wrist, and my knees scraped on the floor as I was dragged. I screamed and welled, but he didn't stop. When we were deep in the forest, I was thrown on the floor, and I watched the man pull out a jagged dagger. The fear of death made me scream even louder as I watched him place the dagger over my heart. I didn't want to die as I hadn't lived my life yet, so I begged and sobbed for him to spare my life. I could feel the tip of the dagger pierce my skin now, so I continued to vehemently plead for my life. A part of me thought my life was over and that I would be slaughtered like an animal in the forest, but that's when I saw the hesitation in his eyes. The man who was just trying to kill me a second ago slowly took off his dagger and he let me go. I thought he was showing me mercy at first, but I was wrong. The man didn't say anything, but I could tell from his eyes that even if he didn't kill me now, he knew it wouldn't take long before a couple of wild animals would tear me apart. And I was just a dead girl walking. I wasn't going to accept that gruesome fate lying down, so I ran as fast as my legs could carry me. I was frightened, but I knew that whatever I was running toward was much better than my murderous mother and her brutal huntsman. I'd almost stained my hands with the blood of a seven-year-old child. While I didn't pierce her heart with my dagger, I know I've already killed her. There are wolves, bears, and mountain lions traversing this forest. It's only a matter of time before one of them kills her and feasts on her remains. What a waste. I do hope her demise is painless, as the child is too pretty to suffer. I let her go because I couldn't bring myself to kill such a beautiful child, so I left it to the animals. I know it was cowardly, but it was as if a stone had fallen from my heart, and I felt nothing but relief. As I watched the running child disappear from my view, I wondered what I was going to do about her mother's morbid request. The order she'd given to kill the child was already gruesome enough. But what I dreaded even more was what she told me to do next. Her instructions were clear. After I was summoned, the queen said, Take Snow White out into the woods. I never want to lay eyes on her again, so you must kill her there. When the child is dead, I want you to cut open her corpse and bring back her lungs and liver. I had heard rumors about the queen being a cruel witch, and after meeting with her tonight, I'm starting to believe all the so-called rumors were true. I wondered what the queen was going to do with the child's lungs and liver if I had cut them out of her. I also knew I couldn't go back empty-handed, and as fate would have it, a wild boar crossed my path. I hunted the boar down, and after killing the animal, I took out its lungs and liver. As I carried the bloody organs back to the palace, I prayed the queen wouldn't realize my deception. She was a smart woman and a skilled witch, so I knew it wasn't going to be easy. When I'd finally arrived at the palace, I presented the organs to the queen. She looked at them with joy as she smiled and said, Well done, huntsman. I then breathed a sigh of relief as I asked her, Your Highness, I assume you asked for these organs to prove I did the deed, and now that I've shown you the hard proof, I hope I've proven my loyalty. I shall get rid of these organs now, for they are foul. The queen looked at me and said, You would do no such thing, huntsman. Don't even dare to throw organs away. I want you to hand the lungs and liver to the castle cook. I could see the cook waiting at the corner of the room, so I walked over there and handed him the bloody entrails. The cook took the organs and put them in a pot. He then added salt and proceeded to boil them. After they were boiled, he put them on a plate and served them to the queen. I then watched in horror as the queen devoured these organs with a smile on her face. 
The cannibalistic act made me sick to my stomach, as I knew the queen had no idea it was a boar's lungs and liver she was consuming. She fully believed she was eating the organs of her own daughter, and she was doing it with a sick smile on her face. I held down vomit as I watched her clear the plate. It horrified me to think that the queen's plan all along was to kill and consume the liver and lungs of her own child. As a huntsman, I had seen many beasts in my life, but I had never known a beast as vicious and as evil as the queen sitting before me. I didn't know how long I'd been running, but I didn't stop. I felt sharp stones pierce my feet. I felt thorns tear at my skin. I saw and heard the wild animals jump at me, but I kept running till my legs couldn't move anymore. I knew I couldn't keep running forever, and I prayed to come across something, anything that could help me. And that's when I saw it. Right there, in the middle of the woods, was a little house. I thought I was hallucinating at first, but it was really there. So with no other option, I ran inside. The items I found in the house were a bit odd, as all the dishes and cutlery seemed to have shrunken down. I also noticed some vegetables and bread on these little plates, and I quickly put them in my mouth as I was extremely hungry. When I was done eating, I saw that there were seven beds in the house. I tried to lie in these beds, but I didn't fit in any of the first six. However, the seventh bed was perfect so I found myself dozing off. I found myself dozing off because I had no strength left in my body, and it wasn't long before I slept off. I awoke a little while later to see seven little men surrounding me. I was frightened, but I could tell from their kind eyes that they weren't bad people. They asked me what happened, and I told them how my mother tried to kill me and how I ran until I came across their house. The dwarfs then said, If you will keep house for us and cook, make beds, wash, sew, and knit, and keep everything clean and orderly, then you can stay with us, and you shall have everything that you want. I was very grateful that they weren't kicking me out, so I said, yes, I'll do everything with all my heart. That's how it was from then on. Every morning, the seven dwarves went into their mountains, looking for ore and gold, and I kept their house for them. Before they left, the dwarves often warned me, saying, Be careful of your mother. She is a powerful witch, and she will soon know that you are here. Do not let anyone in the house. I always heeded their instructions, so we all got along well, and for the first time in a long while, I was happy. The days quickly passed by. Most of them were uneventful, until one day when a peddler came by, selling beautiful wares, clothes, and bodice laces. My clothes were already worn at this point so I decided to buy a bodice lace. I knew the dwarves told me not to let anyone in, but she seemed like an honest woman, so I let her in. I bought one of her bodice laces, and she offered to tie the strings for me, but as she touched the strings of the garment, I felt them tighten themselves. Like dark magic, the laces choked and strangled me, and the peddler now had a sick grin on her face. I realized it was my mother in disguise and she left me there to be strangled to death. I stayed there, gasping for air, and I was about to pass out when the drawers came home and saved my life. The horrific experience made me a lot wearier than I was, so I made sure to never let anyone in the house again. A couple of weeks passed after that before we had another visitor. It was an old woman this time. She said she was selling some goods, and she urged me to open the door and let her in. I didn't agree and I told her to leave. But she brought out a comb and said, Come, child, let me just comb your hair, and you'll see how nice it feels. I didn't want to let her in, but I felt bad for the old woman. She had already come all this way, and even if I wasn't going to buy anything, I went out of the house to let her comb my hair. But once the comb touched my scalp, my whole body was paralyzed, and I was unable to move. I was left there in the cold to die, but luckily, the dwarves came home soon. They realized I was poisoned by the comb that was still in my hair, so they removed it and washed the poison out of my hair. I had been fooled again, and it almost cost me my life, 
My mother had tried to kill me two times now, and I wonder why she didn't want to leave me alone. I swore to myself that there wouldn't be a third time, but it wasn't long before we had another visitor. A peasant woman made her way to our house in the morning. She was carrying a basket with what seemed to be red apples. Before she reached our door, I stuck my head out of the window and said, I am not allowed to let anyone in. The drawers of this house have forbidden me to do so. Please leave. The peasant woman then responded with, That is all right with me. I'll just easily get rid of my apples. Here, you can have one of them for free. The woman then brought out a red apple from her basket, so I said, No, I cannot and I will not accept anything. I thought the peasant woman would understand that I didn't want anything from her and leave, but she stood her ground and said, Are you afraid of poison, child? Look, I'll cut the apple in two. You eat the red half and I shall eat the white half. The woman then split the apple before putting the white part in her mouth. I still didn't want anything from her. But before I could tell her to leave again, I felt a strange feeling come over me. It felt like I was being enchanted by the red apple, as my hands started to move by themselves. I tried to fight it, but it was no use, and before I knew what was happening, I had already taken a bite out of the red apple. The world around me started to darken, and I watched the peasant woman transform into my mother. As I struggled to breathe, she looked down at me and said, I curse the day you crawled out of my womb, you insolent child. She then laughed before continuing with, White as snow, red as blood, black as ebony wood. This time the dwarves cannot awaken you. The darkness had almost surrounded me now, as I couldn't see much anymore. I felt tears run down my cheek as I knew I was dying. I tried to call out to the dwarves, but my lips couldn't move, and it wasn't long before everything finally went black, and the only thing I could see was darkness. We came home to find the child that we've loved so much lying dead on the floor. We tried everything to revive her, but we couldn't. All seven of us sat next to her, and we cried and mourned for three days. We were going to bury her, but even in death, she was still beautiful, as her skin did not decay. We told ourselves, we cannot bury this beautiful child in the black earth. We then made a transparent glass coffin so that she could be seen from all sides. We wrote our name on it with golden letters, and we placed the coffin on the mountain. Each of us promised to always watch after her, as we loved her like she was one of us. It was my fifth trip to this forest. My father had always told me that, as the prince, I should make myself familiar with the land. I had gone through this forest many times, but this time was different, as I had come across a little house filled with seven dwarves, and these dwarves possessed a priceless treasure. This treasure was a transparent glass coffin, and a beautiful girl was lying in it. Her beauty was otherworldly, as I had never seen anything like it. I begged the dwarves for it telling them that I would give them anything, but they said they wouldn't give it up for anything in the world. I wasn't going to give up, as I felt like I would die if I couldn't lay my eyes upon her every day. So I said, Then give it to me, for I cannot live without being able to see Snow White. I will honor her and respect her as my most cherished one. The dwarves saw my love for Snow White. It took a while, as they didn't want to give her up easily but they eventually agreed. The very next morning, I ordered my servants to pick up the coffin and take it back with me to the castle. One particular servant was unhappy with this, as he said, My lord, my back aches terribly, and I see no need for us to carry this corpse of a child to the castle, no matter how beautiful it is. I then responded with, You would do as you were told. She is mine, and I will cherish her forever. So pick up the coffin and follow me. Angered, my servant opened the coffin and struck Snow White with his fist. I immediately reached for my sword to kill him, but before I could take off his hand, I noticed the blow had caused Snow White to spit out something that was stuck in her throat. And to my surprise, I saw her beautiful eyes open. She lifted the lid of the coffin, and it was love at first sight. 
She was also a bit confused, so I told her everything that had happened. I then asked her if she would like to come to my father's castle and be my wife. We hadn't spoken much, but the connection and love between us were strong. So she agreed, and it wasn't long before we planned our wedding. The day of our wedding was the happiest day of my life. I laughed, ate and danced with my bride, and I couldn't think of anything that could be better than this. As the celebrations continued, I noticed someone who wasn't supposed to be there. It was Snow White's mother, the evil queen. My bride had told me everything that she had done to her, and I felt my heart fill with anger. I could tell she was shocked to see her daughter alive, as she stood there frozen with a baffled look on her face. Since she was distracted, I ordered my men to seize her. I had a feeling she would show up, so I prepared one of the most brutal punishments for the wicked like her. I ordered a pair of iron shoes to be put in burning coals and heated till they shone bright red. These shoes were quickly brought forth with tongs and placed before her feet. I then forced her to step into the heated iron shoes. Her screams filled the entire kingdom as I made her dance in agony and I wasn't going to stop until she died. The smell of burning flesh filled the air as I laughed and watched my mother dance in the red-hot iron shoes. She screamed and called out to me, but I clapped and left her to keep suffering. Yes, she was my mother, but she deserved everything that was happening to her. I could tell the heated iron shoes had burned off all the flesh in her feet as the heat had started eating into her skin and bones. She was frothing at the mouth, and her eyes were bulging red as she danced around, wailing. The heat from the iron shoes had completely burned both her feet now, and it wasn't long before my mother dropped dead at my feet. I felt nothing as I watched them remove her feetless corpse from the premises. I had come to realize that we both couldn't exist in this world, and my mother had to die for me to have my happily ever after. So there you have it, the gruesome but true story of Snow White. As you now know from hearing the story in its original version, there was no wicked stepmother, as the woman who did all these heinous things was Snow White's very own mother. A lot of things had to be taken out and changed from the original version, like the act of witchcraft, the morbid cannibalistic acts, the repeated murder attempts, Snow White's young age, and her mother's gruesome end. This was all too dark, so we were given an easier ending that told us Everything was fixed with true love's kiss. But that was all a lie, as Snow White had to kill her mother to get her happy ending. So now that you know the truth, my question to everyone listening to this is, what are you willing to do to get your own happy ever after? Hello everyone. We are thrilled that you have been enjoying our videos. Your support means the world to us. If you've liked what you've seen, please consider liking and subscribing to our channel. We would love to hear which one of our videos is your favorite. We're on a mission to reach 100,000 members in the SSG family, and with your help, we can achieve that goal. Thank you for being a part of our journey. Once upon a time, when there was more good in the world than evil, there was a kingdom under the ocean ruled by a ruthless king. He had several daughters, and each of these daughters helped the king in ruling his underwater kingdom. His youngest daughter, who was but sixteen, was sweet Ariel. She had long red hair and was the fairest of them all. The king ruled his kingdom with an iron fist and was a stern man. He knew that the people on the land were evil, and he trusted them the least. He warned all his daughters to never go anywhere near land. He always said that you're the safest here, underwater, in our kingdom. The ground folk are cruel and evil, and they'll do anything for wealth. But little Ariel often dozed off when her father gave these speeches. According to her, he repeated the same lecture so many times that by now each of her sisters had it by heart. But unlike her, each of her sisters always listened to their father and remained deep under the ocean where their father could protect them. 
Ariel, on the other hand, enjoyed the fresh air, the blue sky, and the flying birds. However, whenever she spotted a ship, she swam right back down to the depths of the ocean she called home. But as she grew older, she became bored with her mundane life as a sea princess. She was never involved in the ruling of the ocean like some of her elder sisters. She was just the little daughter of the king. Now at 17, Ariel wanted her freedom more than anything, and what better than the land to explore? So she finally decided to go up and explore the land. But on the night she decided to go ashore, she saw a wrecked ship on the far end of an island. She went near the ship and saw a handsome young man around her age, lying face first in the sand. It seemed like their ship had drowned near the island, and this man was swept ashore along with the wrecked parts of his ship. He is unconscious, and Ariel does everything in her power to wake him. The moment his blue eyes land on her, he is mesmerized to see a real-life mermaid, no less one so beautiful. Ariel hides behind a rock once he is fully awake, and once he assures her he won't hurt her, she finally comes in front of him. This is the first time Ariel had any interaction with a human, and the man before her wasn't at all cruel or evil. He seemed friendly, and he thanked her for saving his life. For the next several nights, Ariel met this handsome young man named Eric on the shore of that island. They spoke and laughed and enjoyed each other's company. One night, however, Eric said, Do you wish to see more of my world? The land has pretty fascinating things to offer. Many beautiful places to see, several types of food to try, and the animals on the land are different too. Would you like to come with me? I love that, but I can't be out of the water for too long, or else I would die. That made Eric sad, and that's why it upset Ariel too. But instead of being sad and helpless, Eric had a solution. He may have the looks of a prince, but he was the son of a fisherman, so he knew a thing or two about keeping fish alive out of the sea. What if I put you in a water tank and show you all the pretty things in the world? That way you won't die and we can be together. Ariel, being the innocent girl that she was, thought it was the most brilliant idea and agreed to see the world with Eric. They decided to meet the next night on the same shore. Ariel had a small bag with her and was hiding behind a big rock waiting for Eric to arrive. And soon he did. Come here, my dear. He called out to her and Ariel swam to him. But before she could say a word, a big fishing net fell on her from above. Two huge men stepped from behind tall palm trees and lifted her along with the net and put her in a big blue drum full of water. That drum was too small for her and she struggled to get out, all while screaming for Eric to help her. However, when she heard his conversation with the two thugs, her blood turned cold. Take the fish away and present her to the king. We will get a handsome amount of money in exchange for her. She will forever be caged in the king's aquarium, along with the other fish. And we will be on our way, far, far away from this place, Eric said, and the two men laughed in agreement with him. The moment she was loaded in a horse cart to be taken to the king, she knew she should have listened to her father and stayed in the ocean kingdom. That day she was presented in the king's court, and the king bought her for his aquarium by giving Eric and his companion a small fortune. After that, she was put in a big fish tank with other fish caught in the sea. Every animal in that tank was sad and deprived of its freedom. But Ariel had become the prime attraction. The land people had no idea that the merfolk really existed, and there were flocks of people like sheep gathered to get just a glimpse of her. The fish tank handlers poked her with long sticks and fed her rotten fish. Once, she was a princess, and now she had become a show doll. Indeed, the land people were as cruel as her father described them to be. Meanwhile, her absence was noted in the Sea Kingdom, and her father the king had sent his troops into the deepest and darkest corners of the ocean, only to return with no news of the princess. With no way to find his daughter, the king approached the sea witch, Ursula. She and the king had a long-standing rivalry, but she always favored all the princesses. When the king told her about the lost princess, 
She looked into her glass orb and saw an image of an imprisoned Ariel in a fish tank, surrounded by land people. The king was ready to raise revolt against the land folk to get his youngest daughter back, but Ursula had a better plan. She was the master of sorcery and had a master plan. She waved her wand and cast a spell on Ariel, and instantly the mermaid in the tank lost her green tail and two legs appeared in its place. The tail was discarded as an artificial skin. When the king got to know about his mermaid being just a red-haired girl wearing a fake fishtail, he felt deceived and tricked. He let Ariel go and sent his soldiers to look for Eric, the fisherman, and his two companions. The king's soldiers caught the trio and brought them before the king, who beheaded all three for tricking him. Ariel rushed to the sea and jumped inside. The moment her body was submerged into the ocean, her fishtail reappeared and she was reunited with her family. The Sea King was happy to have his little princess back in his kingdom, safely where she belonged. In this story, Ursula turned out to be the helpful witch, and Eric was the evil one.